えー、それでは、えー、ラインセッション午後のセッションを始めたいと思います、えー、午後のセッションは2つありますがまず第2セッションとして、えー、テーマオーナーシップと市民参加ということで、えー、まず初めに20分間、えー、世界風力,発風力エネルギー協会で事務局長をされているステファン・ゼンガーさんに、えー、基調講演をお願いいたしますでその後あとまた先ほどのように、えー、パネリストに登壇していただいて対話ディスカッションをやっていきたいと思いますえー、それではまず簡単に、えー、とスピーカーの、えー、ステファンさんのご紹介しますけれども、えー、ステファンさんは、えー、世界風力エネルギー協会で事務局長をされておりまして、まあ、世界の風力発電の普及発展というのを、えー、リードする役割を担っておられますで世界風力エネルギー協会は、えー、毎年、えー、世界風力会議というのを開催していましてその中で、えー、と一つ重要なワーキンググループというかセッションというか、えー、グループがいましてそこで、えー、コミュニティパワーということを、まあ、世界中の経験なり、えー、実績というのを共有して、まあ、これから先その地域で、えー、民主的にデモクラティックに、えー、自然エネルギーを増やしていくそのためにはどうやったらいいのかどういう考え方なのかということを、えーまあ、あのいろいろ議論しているグループがあって、まあ、そこのところにもコミットされています。というわけで、えっ、ー、と最初の、えー、スピーカー、えー、ステファンゼンガーさん、えー、講演お願いいたします。Thank you very much for this kind welcome and thank you very much for inviting me to this important event. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Thank you very much for also inviting me here and for offering us this opportunity of working together for this important event. I think for Japan it's a very important point of time.、Um, I want to give you an idea of、um, the importance of community power, starting with a, an overview of the development of wind power in the world, and then、um, giving you some reasons why we feel community power is important and、um, what we feel、um, how community power can be done. Um, give you a very brief overview of the history of wind power utilization. This is mainly referring to Europe, of course. So, the first windmills, and of course, we have to understand that this used to be over centuries done on the community level, on the local level, because it was usually owned by one person.、Uh, the first windmills came to Europe. From the Arabian countries in the 12th century, and they, they distributed over, all over Europe so that at the end of the 19th century, there were 20,000 windmills around in Germany and 200,000, that's a rough estimation, in Europe. Actually, the 20,000 in Germany in the 19th century, that's about the number we have modern wind turbines today in the country. Then, in the end of the 19th century,、um, pioneers in Especially one from Denmark, Paul Lacour,、uh, started uh, uh, generating electricity from wind power. And then technology improved, and in the 1930s, there's been first ideas of having multi megawatt, really big wind generators. But actually, at the same time, after the Second World War, slowly、um, the、um, politicians started to phase out. Windmills, like mills, traditional water mills in general. And there was in Germany a special law dedicated to promote the decommissioning of windmills, also、uh, hydro mills in Germany. Also, that led to a preliminary stop of research on wind technology. And so you can say that around 1970, there w a s hardly any windmill activities left in Germany. I think that accounts for most European countries. Until the oil crisis in the 1970s started and then the Renaissance started. And it's very interesting to see that、uh, a very big step was taken technology wise in Denmark at the end of the 1970s again, where a community 
developed a multi-megawatt turbine. It's two megawatt turbine, that's a size that is still very common today. So wind turbine um, by, owned by a school that was really developed by the teachers and by volunteers. And this wind turbine is still in operation and started in 1978. So this kind of technology achievement was done based on community involvement. At the same time, we saw in Germany, also in other countries, some so-called failures of the big industry. In Germany, a three megawatt prototype of a windmill was, of a wind turbine, a modern wind turbine was erected in 1983 by some of the very big companies, amongst them RWE, one of the big utilities in Germany. It was only in operation for a couple of weeks um, and it failed, it did never work properly. Um, it's very strange that at the same time, while a community in Denmark started or had already a, a turbine of a similar size in operation that worked very well, the German big companies, they failed in doing that. There might be some reason behind that, and we have one quotation of one of the board members of one of these companies who said, we need Grovian in order to demonstrate that it does not work, because they didn't, of course, want to have competition to their nuclear and coal power stations. Um, I found a very interesting also um, piece in a, in a so-called Renewable Energy Museum in Italy, where you saw, uh, you can see a 55 kilowatt turbine also developed in the 80s, developed, as you can see, by Fiat, very big company together with Enel, big utility, and they wrote, they writing there, probably it's still there today, that that failed, it didn't work. Kind of shame for these companies if you see again what the um, community did in Denmark at the same time. So obviously there were some other reasons behind that, and just the big companies had not really an interest and incentive to doing that. So as we can see, this really, the development from the beginning was driven by communities. That's important to understand. So we are today at a worldwide capacity of modern wind turbines of almost 240, well, now certainly has crossed already 240 gigawatt. You can see when we look around the world that again, starting from such small initiatives, some countries have reached now really high shares of wind power. China has become the leader in wind power with a globe, with a total installed capacity of more than 60 gigawatt, followed by the United States, Germany, and Spain, and India. These are the five, uh, the top five countries in wind power installations. And you have a look at the offshore installations. That's also something I'd like to mention in this context, because many people, especially I think in Japan, they have a lot of hope in, in offshore wind. Um, um, we have not yet gathered the complete figures from 2011, so this is 2010, but what you can see here is that the share of offshore wind in the total global installations is quite marginal. It's below 2%, and actually according to the preliminary figures that we have, it, the share of offshore wind went down in the past year. So um, that's something you can see that really the mainstream of wind technology utilization to today is, and in the at least midterm future will be onshore wind farms. So when we have a look at some more key figures, I think it's very impressive to see that wind power today generates around 500 terawatt hours. That's equivalent to Germany's electricity demand and represents around 3% of the global electricity demand. Some countries have a much higher share than that, of course. Denmark is the leader with, but the 21% may not even be true. It's, I think it's even a bit more right now. Uh, followed by Portugal, Spain, both of them coming close to 20%, and Germany having now almost 10%. Um, we have countries that have set up very ambitious targets. So China had initially, a couple of years ago, a 2020 target of 20 gigawatt for 2020. That is now more close to 200 gigawatt. In Germany, the German Wind Energy Association made a calculation that if you use only 2% of the land area, that would be suitable for wind power, enough wind, no other reasons why not to use it, then that could contribute to cover two-thirds of Germany's electricity supply. And the Indian Wind Power Association um, has published also a report that they would like to see 20% of India's wind ele uh, electricity covered from wind by the year 2020. And the government today in India is now rather supportive of such an ambitious target. Of course, we've seen 
success in many countries, but there are some uncertainties, of course. For example, in the US, one of the big markets still, there are some uncertainties about the future um, support scheme for wind, the production tax credit, and Spain recently suspended all support for renewable energy electricity generation. What we see as the basic preconditions for wind power is five policy principles should be followed. One is have a level playing field, of course, no distorted margin, um, markets, investment security. That's especially important when we talk about involvement of communities. The communities that they can benefit directly, the communities where the wind power is harvested. And I'll come back to that a bit later in detail. And secure and efficient promotion scheme is also something which is worthwhile having a closer look when we look at the, the expected return on investment, which type of investor expects which um, return, and provide access for newcomers and independent power producers. So all these discussions are usually taking place on the, on the local level, and that's something I'd of course like to encourage you in Japan to look into this and try to support um, such initiatives. So we see that a well-designed feed-in tariff um, is a very good driver to enhance community investment because then they have investment security and they can make sure that they get the money back that they invest. Now, uh, let's have a look at the importance of community power. And we know that, of course, when we use wind energy, the wind turbines are close to where the people are living. So it, it is important what the people think about the wind turbines. And obviously, there's a quite different attitude when we compare community-owned wind farms and those that are compared by companies that are not directly related to the community. So you can see here a study. Um, this one here is from Scotland, which resulted, um, made a survey amongst the, the neighbors of or people in the community, two communities, one where there is a wind farm that is owned by the community. This is the, um, the blue uh, boxes here, the Giga wind farm, and the other one, the green one, is the com uh, community where the wind farms is not owned by the local community. So you can see that in the blue case, the community wind farm, more than 70% of the people living there say that they are very supportive of an increased development of wind power in Scotland. So that uh, study was done in Scotland. And another more than 20% were supportive. Of course, in the case of the non-community wind farm, the support was also substantial, but obviously lower. And then even the impact on the landscape was seen as by the community-owned wind farm. 50% of the people said there is a very positive visual impact of the wind farm on the local landscape. So they really like to see the wind turbines. Similar study done in Germany, again, two communities, one owning the wind farm, the other one um, not owning the wind farm. The red one, Nossen, is the one that does not own the wind farm, and the blue one, again, is the one that owns the wind farm. So you can see that people asked, do you like more wind turbines in your neighborhood? That in the case of the community-owned wind farm, the majority, clear majority has a neutral or positive or even very positive attitude. They want more wind farms in the neighborhood. So it's very obvious that people just like to see more wind turbines and that in the case of community-based ownership, problems of uh, acceptance are quite different. We've even come to discussion, and that's a very serious matter in some countries around the world, that some people now pretend that there is a wind turbine syndrome. It says that people are getting headache from the wind turbine in their neighborhood, and that's something we have to deal with, actually. So as an association, we get requests, what can we say? if people say they get sick from that wind turbine. So fortunately, there was a, a study done by the government of Massachusetts, and they gathered an, uh, some experts, environmental, but also um, medical experts, and they said they couldn't find any evidence for a wind turbine syndrome. They saw that it is, they saw they, there is a clear relation between the symptoms that have been described and a factor they identified as annoyance about the wind farm. So obviously, if people don't feel related to the wind farm, they see it as something they, they are annoyed about, then they don't 
like the wind farm, then and they refer that the headache they get from that to the wind farm. But actually, it's something that is more in how they are related to this uh, project. And then the doctors came to the conclusion that this should be encountered by best practices, of course, appropriate planning distances to residential areas, but also by community ownership, because it's obvious that when people own the wind farms that they are more positive. So what we can see now, there are some parts of the world where it's really a mainstream model. In Denmark, well, there's estimations of around 200,000 families owning wind farms. Germany, their shareholders, more than two to 300,000. There are many countries now in the world which have started to look into community power. I think it's a, a quite remarkable statistics here in, in Germany, German ownership of wind power in 2010 out of the 27,000 megawatt, more than 50% were owned by individuals. Then substantial share also was owned by developers, which are usually small or medium-sized enterprises, and only 7% by the utility utilities. And these 7% own 80% of the conventional capacity. So there is really a revolution taking place in this country, but you can see that that's possible. So these 27,000 megawatt today um, contributing already 10% to Germany's electricity supply, they are mainly owned by individuals, by communities. We've understood this importance for the future of wind power from the beginning, and that's why our association, we've put a special focus on promoting community wind. At the end, it's also a matter of democracy, because the closer we are to the people and the more they are involved in the project as shareholders, the more they can take part in decision making, the more democratic it will be. That's why we established a community power working group as kind of output of the first World Wind Energy Conference, which we did under this special theme of community power in Canada. And one of the colleagues who was involved in, in the conference, Jose Echeverry, uh, he will speak later in the next session. He's here. Jose? Not here at the moment. So, ah, Jose. So it was a very successful conference because the politicians came to this conference and they saw almost 1,000 people there who really wanted to invest in wind energy. And so the minister who was just new appointed, he then said, yes, okay, I will try to make sure that you will have the right conditions. And then he, he kept his promise. And about a year later, the first feed-in law in North America was adopted by the Parliament of Ontario. That was a great breakthrough. And Ontario is now kind of pioneer of community power because they even gave a special incentive to community projects. So community projects have a higher feed-in tariff. We also saw, on the one hand, we want to promote community power, that there is a, a risk of watering down this term of community power, which is a very attractive term, like sustainability used to be, but now everybody talks about sustainability. So that's why we decided we should have a definition of what are we talking about. Of course, on the global level, we have always to be a bit abstract. And we are always in this kind of um, trying to balance on the global level to work together, but support local people. So that's why we came to a definition of community power to make sure that really it's not community power. It's not when a big company just sponsors a local kindergarten, but when it's real shareholders and stakeholders from the community. So we set up three criteria. One is the shareholders of the project. The second is the voting control of the project. And the third is the benefits of the project. And we said that if two of the three criteria, more than 50% belongs to the local community, that's what we call community power. It doesn't mean that we don't want other projects, but we just want to make sure it's clear what community power means. Politicians need such kind of guidance, of course, that they understand if they want to support wind, if they want to get the support of the people, they should look at such criteria. Of course, the reasons why we did it has, has also some technical reasons why we came up with these three um, criteria, because the legislation in different countries is different. Um, what I also wanted to mention here is, of course, again, for, seen from a global level, there's a huge range of potential forms of community ownership. It can be a simple company, according to our definition, also can be a farmer or two, three farmers. They can create a company. 
Of course, the most common term would be a cooperative. But then again, it depends on the local uh, legal situation. So that's something that you should uh, try to find out here in Japan, what's the best model for that. And uh, I know there is some experience here. So it's very important, of course, to create the necessary networks and talk about exchange information, which models are working well. I'd like to refer you to our next World Wind Energy Conference, which also will reflect a lot what's the current status, and I see this as a next step after the 2008 Community Power World Wind Energy Conference that we had. So we will have the next Community Power Citizens Power, we called it, to make clear also that there is an, an aspect of citizens' rights and democratic decision-making involved. It will happen in Bonn in July, and we have got an overwhelming response so far with almost 200 abstracts from almost 40 countries all over the world, from also developing countries, fortunately. And again, here we will have the people that are actually involved in community projects, can be mayors, can be local utilities, it can be small, medium-sized companies, farmers, they all come to exchange their experiences. I think this is really key, that we create the networks without centralizing too much. That we create the networks that we can assist each other, that we can help each other, and then make it a success, mobilize the people, and then at the end lead to a cleaner, more sustainable, and also more um, democratic energy supply, which will also be safer, not only in environmental terms, but also in terms of for the economy. Local resources are always available almost everywhere, and if you use them, then it's good for the whole society. Thank you very much for your patience, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So, the panel discussion is going to be the panel of 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 the